Right, so let me just show you. So this is the gene bitters. And again, if you have your R open, you can follow me. If you need uh, something, whilst you are following me, you can let me know and then I will address it. Just um, let me know and then I will address it. So this, okay, this is, this is a bit smaller. So let me just zoom in a bit. So you can see that I've shown the data set here. Okay, of course, these ones are numerical and the last three are categorical. We know this data set already. <clears throat> you can attach the data and then we can do a lot of things, okay? So for example, we're able to generate the regression line. We've done this thing, we generated the regression equation. We've got all the fitted information, the 3Ds, and then we came to the multiple regression this was a multiple regression that we had, which we generated. And we're able to interpret all of the scores, everything that you gotta know, the fitness of the model, the joint statistics, the individual you know, significance, the partial significance, all of that. Interpretation of the dummies, of the numerical variables. You can extract the mean squared error and then the root mean squared error. You can extract all of them, all of them which shows you the, the, the fitness, okay, the, the efficacy of the regression. You can do the ANOVA analysis, which is this. You can do the fitted, compare that with the residual. Then one of the assumptions of regression is that the mean of the error term should be zero. So we tested it here. And you can see that here, the value here is approximately zero. It means that there are 17 zeros before the fall. With the, before the negative one. So that, that clearly shows that it is zero. Now, there are some few things you can do. You can plot the residuals. And this was a plot of the residuals. Okay. And one of the assumptions of the regression is that the residuals must be homoscedastic. We'll come, we'll come to that under diagnostics. You can plot other things about the residuals. Okay. There are several, several things that you can do when it comes to the residual. You can plot them. Okay. And these are some of the normality of the residual. So when you look at it here, you can see the majority of the data set are not on the line. They are a bit deviational from the line. So the data is likely not normal. And these are some of the tests of normality. You can even detect outliers from the residuals, all of that. Now, my interest is what we're about to do now. You can build multiple regressions by looking at other things. And I want you to look at what I'm about to show you here. For example, you can use this library. And then after this library, you can now generate a new kind of regression. And watch this new regression. And again, you have all the slides there. So this regression tells you, it gives you a kind of a beautiful way to look at a regression. And I'm giving you this because I'll let you do that with a different data set. And you can see that it tells you that observations are 40. It also specifically tells you the dependent variable is a quantity demanded of gene beta scale. It tells you the type of regression you're doing, which is a linear OLS ordinary least squares regression. It gives you the fitness of the model, all the things that talk about the fitness of the model the F test, which is zero, the R square, which is 99%, which tells you that 99% of the variation in the independent variable, in the variability in the dependent variable, which is quantity demanded of gene beta's. That variability is explained 99% by all the independent variables. That just that R square is similar to the R square, which means that the relevant variables are not in the model. And now watch here. We still have the estimate representing the independent variables, the coefficient of each one of them here. Then here you have the confidence interval, the two-tail confidence interval, the lower bound, okay? So this is a lower bound and then the upper bound. Okay. And in order to know whether this variable is significant, what you do is I must fall between the confidence interval. If the, if the Estimate is within the confidence interval. 
then we know that it is significant. Now, as you can see, this one is within the confidence interval. When you look at the ones that are not significant, for example, the p-value here for income, M, shows that it's more significant. So check the very, the value. You can see that the negative point nine eight, and then the positive point, the positive point five six. Well, this one still seems to be within the interval. Okay, it still seems to be within the interval, but you are able to use that to determine the significance of that. Maybe the, the significant levels are, are different. So we check on that. But then you can, it still gives you the p-value, which you can always use to determine the significance of the independent level. We looked at this already. I'm just looking at a different way of looking at the results. So take note of that. We use the J2s to do that. The next thing is this, and I want you to check this. Very important. You can look at this command here. It is still estimating the regression line, but watch something. You can see that I have omitted, watch it carefully. I have omitted the error term, sorry, the constant. So if you look at this one that we dealt with before, the original one here, this one. You see, this one had the intercept. They are the intercept. Okay. But in this second one, I've indicated that I don't want the intercept. So I brought zero before the price. Okay. I brought zero before the price, indicating that I no longer want him to show the intercept. So I'm going to run this regression. I call it gen multi, mall underscore I mean, int. And I'm going to run that and show the summary of the result. And I'm still using the J2s. And you can see that when you do that, watch it. It doesn't give you the, see, it doesn't give you the intercept, unlike the one before. You see this one before here, it gives you the intercept. Okay. However, this very one here, it does not give you what? The intercept. You can see that the intercept doesn't show. The first thing that rather shows is a price. So if you don't want to, if you want to suppress the intercept, it's just a matter of adding a zero in front of the estimation. Please, you got to know this because you do it. Okay. So if you have a question on that, tell me. It's just a matter of add zero plus, then you list all the independent variables. So that's another one. Okay. So this is an, a regression model without an intercept. Keep that in mind, please. The next one is to run gene multi robust. So sometimes you'll be asked to do robust regression. Now, what is that? But a robust regression can be several things. One of them is when you want to correct the standard errors. Please note that in any regression, and again, let me just go back to the original regression that we had, the very, very original. Okay, so I check something, look at it down here. The estimate, which is a coefficient divided by the standard error. Always notice that this estimate, this estimate, okay, divided by this standard error is always giving you the T value. That's it. It gives you the T value or the T table, T, T statistic. And once you read this from the table or using a beautiful computer, you will now get the probability value, which is this last one here. Okay, that's how it works. So the estimate divided by the standard error equals the T statistic, which when read from the table of computer, it gives you the probability. Now, this point I just said is a very important point. Why? Because in a, a new kind of regression you'll be doing, sometimes you want to correct for the standard errors. You can't change the estimate, but you can correct the standard errors, then divide the estimate by that standard error to get a new T value and then the P value. The one way to correct the standard errors is to use a robust standard errors. 
so that you can have a significant result. Okay. So there are several types of these robust standard errors. The one I've used here is HC3. HC3. Okay. And, and it starts from HC0, HC1, HC2, all the way up to HC5. The HC means correction for heteroscedasticity. Okay, so it's like heteroscedastic corrected standard error. That is the HC. Now, if you look at a recommendation by the authors who created the package we are using for this estimation, they use the robust HC3. Okay. So this is what you get. If you set the robust to true, that's what you get. Okay. But if you don't want to set the robust to true, you want to do robust HC1, HC2, you get a different one. But you need to understand that. When you look, use Tata, Tata would use the default of HC1. Okay. So if your goal is to do the analysis in Tata, that's what will happen. Now I'm going to do the robust regression and I want to show you the difference between that and what we have here. Okay, so this is the robust regression and this one, when you have run it, you have to go and then just shoot. Remember, it's only giving you the result here. And this is a result. I just want to clear this so that I can see. It. So down here, you can see that it's telling you that the standard errors have been corrected using heteroscedastic or corrected heteroscedasticity of 0.3. Okay. Everything is as it is before. The only thing, watch it, the coefficients are still the same, but the standard errors have changed. These standard errors have changed. How do you know that they have changed? Okay. I'll show you. Look at it. These standard errors are not the same as the previous standard errors. How do we know? But let's go back to the previous. Okay, these are the previous standard errors. I mean, it shifted a bit, but look at this first one. It's 37. The second one is 1.57. Okay. Now, when you come here, 37 has moved to 32. 1.57 is now 1 1.6. You know, so there are some differences. And you can see that price was significant before now, price is not significant. And you remember that income and location urban were both insignificant. One was 20%, one was 19%. Now, the, the, the location urban is even significant at 10%. So once the standard error changes, the p-value will change. So it is a way to correct for possible heteroscedasticity. I'll talk about that deeply when we are doing um, diagnostics. So that's another model you can have. I've called it a robust regression, okay, or gene multi-robust. Keep that in mind. We're gonna put all of these models together. The next model I decided to do was to run another final model called gene multi-GLM, generalized linear model. How do you run that? It's simple. You just, instead of using LM, you add the gene to it, and then you become GLM. Generalized linear model is a generalization of the models. It can be good sometimes, it can be bad sometimes. So I decided to run that. I'm just running different models and show you how beautiful you can export this to your paper, your thesis. So this is a generalized linear model. Let me just clear this and then show you how the generalized linear model look like. This is a result of the generalized linear model. You can see that the generalized linear model gives you a similar thing like the OLS that we did. Okay. Is it the maximum, the standard errors were solved using the maximum likelihood estimation. And watch it, it gives you some other very other things. For example, it tells you the chi-square, which is a F statistic. It gives you the pseudo R square okay, by two different authors, okay. one author's own, which is McFadden's own is smaller than that of the Krag Eula one. Okay. It gives you the Akake information and then the BIC information. Okay. These are very good things and they will show up in the model, in the final table that we are going to see. Don't worry, I'll give you the detail. All of these are telling you the fitness of the model. 
we'll explain them better when we come to diagnostics. But for now, I just want you to see how it looks like in a table, all the models. How did they all look like in a table? Now to do that, you have to install a package known as Hux table. Then you run the Hux table. So I'm gonna run Hux table, I just did. Then you export the results. Watch the results I'm exporting. I'm exporting all the signs. First, I'm exporting the G multi. I'm exporting the G multi without the intercept. I'm exporting the G multi, which is a robust regression. And then I'm exporting the G multi, which with a GLM. I want the scale to be true so that everything is nicely packaged. Let's see the results. Okay, so this is the beautiful results you are having here. And you see the results are in a beautiful table form and it has been packaged in the way that you would have normally seen in general articles. Okay, what do I mean? You know, sometimes when you read the general papers, they will have model one, model two, model three, model four, and then on and on. And then some of the models excluded the variables. So for example, some of the models, the model two was the one that excluded the intercept. So you can see that model two doesn't have the intercept. Okay. And normally when you have these models like this, it helps you to know which variables are significant, straight on. Please know this. The variable that comes first is the estimate, the coefficient. That's what comes first. The variables in the bracket is the standard error. Is a standard error. Now, when you look at these variables, you can see that the model one, the price was insignificant. Model two, the price is insignificant. Model three, the price is insignificant. Okay. So in all of these three models, all the four models, price was insignificant. But when it comes to complement price, it's significant in all of them. When it comes to location urban, look at it. Location urban. Model one is insignificant, three is insignificant, four is insignificant, but model two is significant, which is interesting. So the question becomes, what is model two? When you go to the table here, you will see the model two is the one without the intercept. So you see the one without the intercept, when you remove the intercept, you now rather have a significant, not just near significant, significantly significant, you know, 0.1% significant for location urban. So which means that the inclusion of the intercept was hampering the significance of this model. So you're able to see the models, you're able to compare some of the models, and you're able to have a feel of how some of the models are behaving. Guys, this is important. Why? Because in some of the general papers I'll give you, you will notice that some of the models are supposed to be based on a model like model two, but they rather base it on a model like, you know, model four, and therefore the author missed the point, okay? So it's important you know, based on the models, which one is giving you more significant results and why. And that is why. And of course, using the J2s, it gives you all the models easily in the table, you know, cutting off all the clutters so that you can focus on the important thing. But look at the bottom, it's beautiful. It tells you the sample size for each one of them, it tells you the R square for some of them, not all of them, because remember the generalized linear model doesn't use the R square, it rather uses something else. It gives you the KIK information and the BIC information, and then the pseudo R square, the GLM gives you that. All of these information at the bottom are beautiful, and they, they speak a lot about the fitness of the model. Also, you get the, the p-values, the interpretation of the p-values. When it is significant at 0.1%, 1%, 5%, to get it all down here so that you can focus on it. So I love this because it's, it's, it's the thing that you normally do when you use to compare models. Another table you can use is called the stargazer. Stargazer. Let me... 
install an input stargazer. Okay, the stargazer, whenever you use it to the set issue, reference it using this referencing approach. Okay. Now, when you run the stargazer, after you've installed it, of course, you now type stargazer and then write the names of the model. He did multi, J multi, the same thing. The one with the intercept, without the intercept, the generalized linear model. So this one, I did only three. I excluded the robust, okay? And then I indicated what information I want. I said the first one should be called OLS. So these are the names you're giving it. The second one, which is a J multi, should be called the OLS with no intercept. NI is no intercept. And then the J multi GLM is the generalized linear model. So the next column, you see the column label names. Then the type is text. So you want the text, you keep the statistic. The following statistics is what you want. The sample size, the R square, the F test, the log likelihood, the Kaki information, the BIC, the log likelihood ratio, the world test. If any of them has any of this, they will pop out. If they don't have, no problem. So let's run this and see the results. Yay. You have this beautiful result right here. So, and then once you have this, you now have a beautiful, beautiful interpretation to make a look at this. This one doesn't just tell you model one, model two, model three, model four, but it rather tells you the names of the model just as you gave it. You remember you gave the names. You said that the names are OLS. No. And then OLS no intercept. And then GLM. You said it yourself. And now they have been nicely packaged. And again, you have the stars to tell you. See, in this model, you are able to know whether the values are significant. You can see that here, price is significant. Unlike the previous one. Yeah. I mean, Hux table is good, but Stargazer is wonderful. And then you can see these ones. Um, they are there as well. The, the, slight, the slight thing I observed is that, watch it, the Stargazer doesn't call intercept at the bottom here. Okay, it doesn't call it intercept. It calls it constant, which is the same thing. And the one without the intercept is the middle one. So you can see that that middle one, the intercept is gone. So it rather brings the independent variables first and then brings the intercept last. And you can see that in all of these models, price is significant in all of them at 5%. Complement price is significant at 0.1%. Income is not significant in any of them. Location urban is significant only with the one without the intercept model. So that appears to be a wonderful model, generally. And I like the way it chops off some of these things here, but shows some of these things there. Okay. So you can see that the location urban, sorry, the location, oh, this one, it, it even brings location rural. Okay. So what it's doing is that it is giving you all the, it, it, it decides to bring the reference category as well. Okay. You can see that it's brought the reference category, okay. which is not really needed, but it's brought them anyway. And then the occupation, teaching, trading, is there then the religion? It's interesting that it doesn't bring those ones, their reference categories. Then finally, the observations are there. The R square is there. And then the log likelihood information is there. The archaic information criteria is there. And, and, and all the necessary things. These are beautiful things. And you can take this straight away to your web document. Okay, straight on. Okay, and start speaking about them, justifying everything that you need to do. So I decided to do this because this is the way it's going now. Instead of taking everything to Excel and then get confused and then all of that. Okay, please, any questions so far on this? At this stage, you have any questions so far? 
any little thing, it is your question that will pull out something from you. Yeah, you're done. Any particular question? Everything I've done is in the slide here, so you can check it. Everything I've done is here. Everything, everything, everything. And then some of the interpretations, we have gone through these interpretations already. But they are all here. Even how to interpret the, the MSE, RMSE, my and mapping. These ones are nicely used when you're doing Python. And you can also use them here. You know, for example, the, the average absolute difference. You know, the interpretation of this to determine the fitness of the model. All right, so all of these things, predictions, everything, we've done all of them you know, up to here. All right, so I want us to, who can tell me what do you understand by the word diagnostics? Who can give me your general idea about it? Diagnostics. What do you understand by that? Diagnostics. Hello, sir. Yes. Yeah, so it's, I think it's to um, uh, look through a, a problem or uh, an issue and look out for the causing um, issues or things that cause, bring about the issue and then try to find solution to it or offer solution to it. Good, good, good. I like the way you started it. Because I'm going to ask a question. What's the difference between diagnostics and diagnosis? They are all nouns. What's the difference between diagnostics and diagnosis? They are related, but they are different things. Diagnostics, diagnosis. So diagnosis, medical terminologies and those things. Okay. Diagnosis, you are identifying the nature and the cause. You are identifying the nature and the cause by examining. That's diagnosis or diagnosis. But the diagnostics, that one, you see, the way the word is tells you that it's plural. You know, and it can also be more stretching, you know. So diagnostics looks more at the tests you are going to do, the procedures, which you are going to use to do the identification you did with the diagnosis. So you want to identify something. You want to, you want to look at the nature and the cause, the conditions of something. But you need a procedure. You need a step-by-step -step algorithm or test to be able to come out of that. So when we look at blood test in medicine, blood test is diagnostic too. That can help you to diagnose whether a person has HIV or not, or whether a person has you know, cancer or not, or whether a person has some anemia or something. You know, so watch it. The, the diagnosis requires a lot of tests. Then that can help you to diagnose or to make diagnosis, which is, which is identifying and finding out. So, so, so I'm saying a driver and a drive, a driver and drive. A, a drive is action. A driver is the one doing the action. All right, I hope you get it, you get it. I need an answer from one person to show that you get it. You get it, oh, it yeah. still sounds Hebrew. You get it. Good. All right. 
one of the first thing to check whether the regression we did is correct. Whether there is no illness or there is illness in the regression. Whether there is no disease in the regression model we generated is to do regression diagnostics. And when you are going to do diagnostics, you must have a possible disease in mind warranting the diagnos diagnosis. So, so for example, before you, you do that, a doctor will say, let's go and do this blood test. He think, he think doesn't get up and go and do the blood test. No, he doesn't do that. He will have, based on the information he's collected from you, he will now Qualize that information. And then he was okay, let's go and do this blood test, that blood test, that blood test, that blood test, and then to see what is happening. Right? Now, with some, some possible diseases in mind. Okay. So maybe you can do kidney tests because you are complaining of some, you know, things related to kidney. You know. Um, heart test, cardio, you know, or the cardi cardiogram test, because you are having chest issues, you know, to go and do some, you know, x-rays, because you are complaining of some breathing problems and things like that. Okay. So he suspects some bronchitis, maybe asthmatic issues. Okay. Or if you have heart issues, you know, let's check your hypertension. Let's probably check of hepatitis. Could that be related to cirrhosis of the liver? Let's check your liver function test and things like that. The diseases in regression you may have that will warrant the diagnosis could be multicollinearity. It could be one of the challenges that is inside a regression. So you want to check whether there is a problem of, of hepatitis B or A or C or whatever. You want to check whether there is multicollinearity problem. If it is not there, no problem, then your regression is fine. But if it's there, we've got to find a way to handle it. So the first challenge, the first diagnostic that we are going to, you know, or the, get, the first diagnosis we are going to do, and then we are going to use a diagnostic for that purpose, is multicollinearity. What is that? Multicollinearity exists when two independent variables are so highly correlated that it becomes difficult to disentangle the partial effects of one from the other on the dependent variable. So multicollinearity has to do with independent variables. That's the first thing. Independent variables. So the variables got to be independent. Two independent variables that are so highly correlated with each other to the extent that their coefficients are high. Their correlation coefficients are probably 0 0.7, even 0 0.8 or 0.9, so high, so close, but never getting to perfect collinearity. Okay. So close that the, the, the individual effect of each one on the dependent variable is missing because they are highly correlated. So each one is influencing themselves first the other first before they even look at the dependent variable. And a typical example of a perfect one is when you have male and you have female and the male is just one minus the female. So this correlation is a problem in the regression. Why? And this is what the problem can happen if they are the variables, the two independent variables are highly correlated. One, it can be a case. Why do you mean by a test? Because the OLS estimators becomes unbiased, but they get large variances and standard errors. Remember, 
the estimate divided by the standard error should be equal to the T value. And when you now get the T value, you can read it from the table or use the computer and you can get the P value. And if the P value shows maybe 0.19, or 0.19, it shows as insignificant. And that insignificance is because the standard error is inflated. And so when the standard error is big, the whole of this T value becomes smaller. And when it becomes smaller, then the P value will be bigger, not no more what significant. So the multicollinearity can cause insignificant P value. That's the first one. Second, you will commit a type one error. The probability of rejecting a true null hypothesis can be there, okay? And the probability of accepting a false you know, null hypothesis is also there. All of these can happen even when your R square is 100%. You know, when your R square is 100%, you are tempted to say that, oh, my model is fit. And yet, how can we have a lot of insignificant p-values? because multicollinearity is causing some problems. So first, let's check. That's the first, it detect. Then second, if it is there, handle it. It's the same thing a medical doctor would do. First, detect it. Second, handle it. So how do we detect it? Okay, so let's go back to our correlation matrix to see which variables were multicollinear. Remember, Multicollinearity had to do with the independent variables. So the column that has the dependent variable is not packed. Okay? So all the column here are not needed. All the information here, we don't need them because they are, they, are, they are showing relationship between the independent variable and the quantity demanded, which is the dependent variable. So we don't need that. What we need are the rest. We need which values are the most multicollinear variables two independent variables that are the most multicollinear. Can you give me the first one? Which number, which coefficient shows the first one? Look, unless you, uh, you maximize the, the, the screen. screen. Yes. Okay. Let me clear this and maximize it. Okay. Is it a bit better? No, dog. Okay. So now let's identify the first coefficient that is showing the highest is what? Looking for the one with the highest coefficient. Point seven. Okay. Four. 0. 0.7 what? 0.76. This one. Second one. 0. 0.74. Negative 0. 0.74. And you can also have 0. 0.74. And then the third one. Uh, 0. 0.73. Negative 0. 0.73. Okay. So these are the top three. So what we are going to now is we know that um, what do you call it? complement price here is highly correlated with price. And we also know that occupation trading is correlated with the price. So price is highly correlated with other things. And then religion Muslim is correlated with income. So we are going to check with our eyes on these, not only on them, all others, but just on this. So keep that in mind. Keep this process in mind. Now, what, how do we go about it? First, we need to do some beautiful work, some diagnostic. There is something we call variance inflation factors, and that's what we use to check and test for the multiple. Variance inflation factors will tell you how high the variances of the regression parameters are by virtue of the collinearity. 
the formula for the variance inflation factor is given by one divided by one minus the R squared. The general rule of thumb is that once the variance inflation factor is bigger than 10, then there is supposedly a high collinearity between the two. That, that, that variable has some high correlation. Okay, it's causing an issue. According to Woodridge, 2013, that is the general thing. But others have also indicated that, well, if the VIF is one, then there is no correlation at all between that particular predictor and then the others. And therefore, the variance of the that particular estimate is not inflated at all. So in other words, if it is one, it's a good thing. If it is more than five, okay, if the VIF is more than five, then there is an issue. But not have a big issue. So it's close to exceeding five. Then we say that there is moderate, moderate uh, variance inflation factor, which means that it's something you can live with it. But if it is 10 or more than 10, oh, then it shows high multicollinearity. Then you go and go and do something about it, go and read about it, go and think about it. And we'll look at how you handle it. The last thing you would ever want to do, probably even never do, is to remove that variable from the data set completely. No, sometimes you only remove it to see what, it, what will happen to the others, but never completely. Okay, so what do you think the variance inflation value in the sample regression will be like? Think about that. The variance inflation factor, what do you think the value in the sample regression will be if you were to calculate it? Remember, one over one minus R squared. I'll leave that to you. Think about it, because that will indicate that you are also thinking about everything. Okay. So how, how do you do execute multicollinear? How do you check it? Let's go to the let's go to the R. Okay. So we're going to check in our R to see how we can handle multicode. First, there's a a package called library car. By now, you don't even, um, you know, you, you have it already there. So you load that package. And then that package is gonna help you to bring out the VVIF. Okay. We'll talk about the VVIF very soon. Okay, because there's a difference between the VIF, the VVIF, and that the GVIF, okay. <laughs> very variance inflation factor. Okay, very variance inflation factor. Okay. Now, how do you work all this? <laughs> the first thing is to run this R, the car package. So we run that now. And then you run this one to check for the multicollinearity. Car, colon, colon, VIF, then the name of the data. Our name of the regression is multi, gen multi. So we run that. And look down here, okay? If you look down here, the entire regression, the VIF is being shown here. Okay, you can see that the VIF are all here. And I spoke about the GVIF. This is a GVIF, but this is a VIF. Now, which one do you use? Which one do you use? I'll come back to that, but let's run the others. The next thing you can do is you can round it. So you can find the variance inflation factor and indicate that I want you to check for me whether the variance inflation factor is bigger than 10. Okay, if it is bigger than 10, it's a big issue that you want to look at. So let's run it. So this one is telling you that a particular variance inflation factor is bigger than 10 or not. Okay, and you can look at this very one to see whether or not. Now, if you want an English question, 
you can use this. Say which of the independent variables are problematic. You can use this command to do that. Which of the independent variables are problematic? Okay, in other words, which of them have a serious multicollinearity? Which of them does not have a serious? So you run this and it tells you false, 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 which means that none of them is having a big issue when it comes to multicollinearity. None of them is having a big issue of multicollinearity. Now, the values of the VIF, like we said, is up to, up to five is not critical. Above five is considerable, you know, above 10 is highly critical. Yeah, above 10 is highly critical. So what is the VIF? The VIF was actually postulated by a man known as Fox and Monet in 1992. And it is a dummy independent variable for polynomial variables. Now, it was designed for numerical variables, take note. But when the variables are continuous variables, watch it. When the variables are continuous, then the GVIF, this one, the GVIF is the same as the VIF. The GVIF is the same as the VIF when the variables are numerical. But when they are categorical, we now get one GVIF value for each dummy. And that's why I'm going to ask you a question. Okay. So for example, one value for all age groups, another value for all religion. So if the religions are Christian religion, Muslim religion, Buddhist religion, you're going to get one for all of them. So the variables which need more than one coefficient and therefore one degrees of freedom are typically evaluated. You only use the GMVI. That is why it's not necessary to look at and this again, I, it's a question I've asked. That's why it's not necessary to look at categorical variables, variance inflation factor. But what was the difference between this one that I've highlighted here and then the GV1 divided by two degrees of freedom? What was the difference? This first one, the first one I said, the GVIF was by Fox and Monet, 92. This second one here is another one that was suggested by Fox and Bonnet again. And it makes the value of the first one comparable. You are able to compare this first one across different beta values. And which will reduce this value, this JVIF, it will reduce the JVIF to a linear measure. So even if it's not linear, it makes it mean. It is similar to taking the square root of the VIF. Okay. So this very one here, it's like, so it, this one is like the variance and this one is like the standard deviation, more or less. So they are similar. That's why you can see that this one is saying false, 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 false. And this one is also saying false, 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 false. So basically, which one do you use? I normally suggest that you can always use the this one, the second one here. All right, now, so how do you, let me go back to the slides here, because there's something I want to show you here, very important. How do you handle the multicollinearity? Now, in our case, remember we didn't get it. We didn't get any big issue there. If an independent variable has a considerable VIF, it can be dropped and the model will be rebuilt using the remaining independent variables that have the low VIF. But that word drop doesn't mean you leave it remove it completely out of the data. No, it means that you put it aside and then run the model again. You rebuild the model, you check the p-values again, and it's not a good practice to consider the VIF values of the dummy variables. This is the point I said, why? Why don't you have to look at the VIF values of the dummy variable? Why? Because they are correlated to each other categories and hence, have a higher VIF usually. So for example, if you look at the religion, Christian. Religion Christian, once I say that he is not a Christian, I'm also saying that he is a Buddhist because the reference category is a Buddhist. Once you say that he is not a male, you are actually saying that he is a female. Okay. 
once you say this person is not a male, you're saying that this person is a female. So it is implicit. So there's no need to find a, a variance inflation factor for a male and for a female because the male is already correlated with a female. So identifying the VIF for, for dummy variables is a very tricky thing and it's not something that you want to do. So that's the first thing you want to take note to why. Independent variables that have insignificant p-values may also be removed. Okay? And then another model is built. So let's say that you get some variables which were insignificant. Like we had that of um, average income of the people in the regression model. And then this average income of the people, you decide that you are going to you are going to remove them from the model. Then you rebuild it. That will give you model five. Then you check what happens to the others. These are some of the diagnosis you're doing. Okay, you do that couple of iterations and see what will happen to the results. A beautiful thing. Okay. And this dropping can continue and continue until a small number or multiple linearity is no multiple linearity is found at all. Now, this normally happens when you have a lot of independent variables. Take note. A lot. And you want to even use a multiple linearity as a way to drop some of them. Because some of them can be so irrelevant. And one way you can clear them is using the multi call linearity. Okay. And of course, you check what they do. You don't check only the p-values. Take note. You're not only checking when you remove it from the model, what it does to the p-value, but you're checking what it does to the R-square, you're checking what it does to the F-test. You're checking all of that. That's a good thing. Good. That will give you a sense of the whole thing. I have not done a particular analysis, and I have done multiple analysis, but I have not done one that I'll show you here. But I'll do one with you with another data set where you can get a feel of it because you will run these things for yourself. So multicollinearity, it's a very, very powerful term and it is something that you want to do. Now, there are several other things you can do with the multicollinearity. I'm going to the R to show you because you can do further thing about the multicollinearity. You can use J2s, which is another packet to we store and then get a bit of things about the multiple. Remember, we've done this J2s model. Remember, the J2s will give you this regression model. We've done it, we've seen this already. And then they will also give you the multicollinearity for that. This is this one, it shows you the multicollinearity. It shows you the multicollinearity on the far right, at the far right here. And you can see that it is giving you the multicollinearities here. Please note that. The multicollinearities that you are getting, they are not the one that you'll ideally, it's not the GVI. Okay. So when you take the square root, it helps you to know whether it is, a, for example, if you look at these ones here, okay, it's the, same, the first values that you are getting here, these are the GVIF, which he calls VIF. But when you take the, the sort of the square root of them. This is what you get. And this one is what we are much more interested in. So I normally recommend that you use these ones. But this second one gives you a fair idea about how another package can also help you to develop. And as usual, less than five is not critical. More than five is considerable. So there are several packages you can use to do that. Okay. So let's conclude by finding out what do you do if it is there? Because in all our cases, it's not there. And by the way, if it's not there in your model, hallelujah, it's good then. But if it is there, what do you do? One, it will affect the estimate. Take it, it will affect the estimates. It will affect the p-values. Okay. It might not affect the predictive power or the fitness of the model, but it will affect the estimates. So what do you do? You remove one or more of the multicollinear variables and rerun the model, we've said that. If the model is the same thing as before, then you bring it back. That's the first one. If it is, it is leading to better 
estimates. Okay. Then you, 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 you keep them removed. Second, you combine some of the predictors in some way. Like you add or you subtract some from the other. So let's say you are talking about size. Okay. Let's say you're talking about, I don't know, you're talking about size, and then you're talking about, um, okay, let's say you're talking about education, and you're talking about experience, okay? And these two are highly multicollinear. Okay, so you might multiply education with experience. So you might create another class. So let's say education is two, this one is four, this one is three, this one is two, you can create education experience and then you multiply them. Okay. You multiply them, you interact with them. So two times two will give you eight here, yeah, three times two will give you six. So you create another column for that purpose. And then you you only you only bring one or one of these two. You now bring this one alone and then that into the model to check again. Or you bring this one and that alone to check again. If they are still causing an issue, you just drop these ones and keep this. You know? So those are some of the things that you can do to handle the multi colonies If it is a big issue, if it's not a big issue, you live with it. Okay, we always say that if it's not a big issue, you live with it. The next thing is that you can perform a principal component analysis. This is something that I, 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 I have videos on, you know, on the channel you can check on your own, okay, not on your channel, but I think in the multivariate channel, you can check it. You, know, you can perform principal component analysis of partial least squares, you know, and that will help you to coalesce, combine some of the variables. You know, and you're able to, to beautifully handle the highly multicollinear predictors as a result of that. So these are some of the ways you can use to handle multicollinearity. Okay, the next assumption, okay, remember there are multiple assumptions. The next assumption, or probably the last assumption I'll look at today. Next time I'll look at other assumptions. But the next assumption you want to look at in a regression is to check whether the mean of the error term is truly zero. <laughs> and it's very interesting because this assumption is something we checked and checked and checked and checked and checked and checked. And checked. Okay. So let's quickly go to our R and check that. Okay. This one is fairly simple. So is the mean of the error term zero? Well, that one is fairly simple. You can just go to the top there. If they have been, you know, we have them, we have them everywhere. Where is that? We have the mean of the error term. There you go. Okay, this command. The mean of the error term. So let's run this. You can see it is negative 4.99708 e to the power negative 0.7. So it shows that there are 17 zeros before the four. Okay, negative seven. This is approximately zero. So it means that the error term is truly, truly what zero. And it's a very nice thing to help you to know that the assumption of regression that says that the expected value of the error term is zero has been satisfied. Hallelujah. And when you are critiquing papers, you have to know, find out whether the paper you are critiquing, has the paper indicated whether they checked for this assumption, whether it has been met? Did the paper check? You know. You have to find out whether the paper actually checked. If it didn't check, you penalize the paper okay, to be sure. Okay. Did the paper take regression diagnosis to be sure? So that is one of the assumptions you can check in that regard. And you want to do that okay, because once you do that, it helps you to be able to focus on all of the things. All right, now the other kinds of diagnostics that we'll do next time. Because when I start them, one of them is long and then we will not be able to finish. So please take note of the next test we are going to be doing. We are going to do normality. Normality. 
are the residuals normally distributed? We'll check for that analytic. We'll also check for another assumption, which is known as, and, and, and the normality assumption will do a lot of tests on that as well. Okay. Um, another, and it will use a lot of graphs to be able to prove test and graph for the normality. We'll check also another assumption, which is linearity. Okay. Remember, one of the assumptions is that there must be a linear relationship. So we'll check for linearity. we we'll also check for heteroscedasticity. We'll check for heteroscedasticity. Okay. Whether or not is there, or uh, whether the residuals are homoscedastic or heteroscedastic. We'll check for that. Okay. We'll check for um, outliers. We check for outlier detection and influential variables. Just take note. Outlier detection and influential variables. We'll check for that. Are there any influences? Okay. And these things are not really, really part of the regression diagnosis, but they are things that you want to check to be sure. And then, I will also give you one powerful, very powerful package that will do all of these things at a go. That's beautiful. It's called Global Regression Check. Okay. Give you one, and that one, once you put it there, it will handle and check for everything for you. Now, the one we will check last is the heteroscedasticity because you got to understand that thing very, very well. Okay. And we will also check for this. Let me just document that. We will also check for multi, sorry, autocorrelation. Autocorrelation of the residuals. We'll check whether or not the residuals are autocorrelated with first order or second order and how to handle that. Please note, these things are fairly simple. Sometimes you don't even check for it, you handle them quickly. Okay. You, you rather use a model that will handle them if it is there at all. So we'll check for autocorrelation, apart from the heteroscedasticity. We check for autocorrelation. Now the heteroscedasticity, checking and solving it is, is quite long. The autocorrelation to checking and solving it, but there's a, something that can do the two all at the go. It's beautiful. And this is what is happening all over the, in the literature. We'll look at the, all of that. And then that'll be it. That'll solve everything that we need to do regarding regression. And that'll be it for cross-sectional regression cross-sectional regression. And then subsequent times, we'll then begin with panel data econometrics. Ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of the entire capital.